just because you're in the New York art scene or the LA art scene does not mean that you are a sophisticated artist and does not mean that if you make something that looks like kitsch, it is not kitsch. It may very well be kitsch. The title of this piece, at least the working title, is Best Friends. There's two women in the frame and they're um, in an intimate space together, yet they're not really involved with each other. They're more involved with their own image and the dogs as their props. I want to be the girl on the left, you know, um, seeing my countenance juxtaposed to her very um, bronzed and luminous um, countenance is somewhat jarring for me to be sitting in front of all day. I think that the bright colors combined with like the tension, at least for me, I experience the two figures in my painting as a kind of a tension, the tension between the older woman and the younger woman. And am I making an equivalence or is the older woman like, is that who the younger woman will eventually, is she the mother or why are they being shown like in the same space as if they're the same when clearly one of them's like thinner and younger and prettier and looks less tired and less like she has a hangover. <laughs> and so I sort of am like the, the prettiness of the palette I see as a way of making you feel sort of comfortable to just come into the painting and then receive the tension that's there in a way that maybe you wouldn't receive that tension if immediately on looking at the painting you already saw it as having tension in it. I was very influenced by Thomas Lawson's essay, Last Exit Painting, talking about representational painting as like this back door for subversive or oppositional ideas in art. Like you come in through the back door because you, if there's layers of meaning and content in the work, then you're disarmed by the dumbness of the initial experience or the familiarity or the conventionalness of it. And then your, your defenses are laid down and then you receive all of the stuff that's actually um, challenges you. And I've always wanted my paintings to look a little dumb because I feel like it's um, it it lowers and and I fucking got trashed for my first review and my first show in New York because my paintings were so successfully dumb looking. <laughs> The last like realist project I tried doing was this series of um, they were boudoir portraits of women artists. That project was it could have been more fun than it was. And some of the artists that I photographed made it really fun by like dressing up for it and um, being really fun subjects. But the way that I was approaching painting them was um was I was trying to be somewhat faithful because I was trying to represent the scene that I was given. And so it ended up being feeling more like a documentarian work. And that ended up sort of killing the joy for me. There is an artist who is, ex oh, his name was Igor Pantuhoff, and he lived from 1911 to 1972. He was, he was in a relationship with Lee Krasner before she was with Jackson Pollock. And he, he was a modern artist in New York who went on to have a very successful career as a portrait painter. But if you actually look at the paintings, they're a hundred percent kitsch and they're extraordinarily awesome. This guy here. I think the thing about them is because you saw imagery like that as a kid in the 70s, um, that very much informed my idea about um, what's pretty. 
and it still does. And so when I see those, yeah, I think it goes to a, a, a childhood place inside. I'm thinking, of course, about the relationship between artist and model. And I've actually been making work about that relationship throughout my career at different times. I keep revisiting it. I'm, I guess I'm very interested in other women artists who chose that as, as a subject. I don't know a lot about Marevna. I don't even know if I'm pronouncing her name correctly, but she painted these two young women a lot. Actually, there's a whole series of paintings of who I assume are probably the same models. Sort of reductiveness of the imagery, it just being these two women um, without any narrative, more narrative information is um, also makes it modern as well as a conceit about subject matter being enough. Like she's saying that this is enough to hold a painting. There's a lot of these modernist painters who, you know, studied in Paris at, you know, Academy Julienne or whatever, like these places, or they studied with, or they, you know, interacted with Picasso and Brock and they were around for cubism and all that stuff influenced them, but they were never considered to have the gravitas or whatever. They were influenced by the avant-garde, but not necessarily included in, you know, certainly not included in surveys of them these days. And whose work often veers towards what looks like kitsch now. And so um, I just am compelled by these characters from the past that have been sort of forgotten about by art history. It occurred to me just in the last few months that I hadn't painted myself since before I had a surgery in 2015, um, a full hysterectomy that I had to have because I had cancer. And it occurred to me that perhaps that menopause that that, that brought on and just the, diff, the sort of changing relationship to my own sense of myself my sense of my attractiveness, my sense of aging, um, that those things were conspiring to make me not find myself an interesting subject anymore. Okay, interesting is not the right word. They were conspiring to make me feel like not a worthy subject, like no one, no one would want to look at me. I'm invisible now. I was giving a talk actually at the... New York Academy um, many, many years ago. And someone in the audience asked me what my relationship was to the human condition in my work. And they brought up Rembrandt. And I just thought that was preposterous. And the reason I guess this is in my mind is because the other day, a gallerist told me that someone who had come in and was talking to them about my, my new work said, oh, she's kind of getting into like a Rembrandt thing here with painting her herself as she's aging. And I thought, oh my God, that's so funny. I was like the anti-Rembrandt. Like, so the paintings of Rembrandt, the way I think of them is zero femininity. Like they're dark, they're brooding. And I th I found them to be sort of self-important. <laughs> when people ask me what my favorite color is, I always say it's opalescent. And so, even though that's not a color, it's, um, it's a multitude of colors. I think about the paintings as I'm trying to make opalescent paintings. Again, that's me, again, trying to push this kind of conceit about that, which is feminine, diaphanous, not trite. I won't use metallic because for me, metallic paints, um, although I should never say I won't do something because that probably means I'm about to do it. <laughs> but what I don't like about metallic paint is that it's similar to glitter, which can be used if you're using it very consciously in a particular way as a conceit. But if you're just using it to make something look good, it's cheating. 
it's just, you are fucking crossing a line. Like, and, and sorry, but I need to keep, I, I, I ain't got much on this planet, but I'm going to try to maintain my credibility here.